Roger and Helen Eakins. Roger Eakins is a fifth generation member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, after serving a mission in Argentina and four years in the U.S. Army. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Utah in 1970 with an Honors Baccalaureate of Art in Arts in English and in 1972 with a Master's in Creative Writing. In 1976, he earned his PhD in Higher Education from the Union Graduate School, Union Institute, and University. Dr. Eakins has served in a series of administrative and teaching positions. These include Director of Open Community Learning Center and Assistant Professor of English at Staten Island Community College, City University of New York, Dean of Student Life and Faculty Review in English and Education, at Johnson College, University of Redlands, Dean of Student Development and Director of the Honors Program at the University of Maine and Augusta, and Dean of Instructional at Instruction at U College in Harville, California, which is my neck of the woods, where he's currently Chair of the Honors Program and teaches literature, writing, and the history of ideas. Ecclesiastical responsibilities in the church have included callings as Bishop, Gospel Doctrine Teacher, and Stake Seminary Supervisor. He's currently serving as a member of the Chico, California State High Council. I also want to point out that his book, Defending Zion, Kingdom in the West, Mormons and American Frontier, Volume 5, Defending, Defending Zion, which is for sale back there, is the winner of the best documentary book from the Mormon History Association. Is that right? Yeah. And so I wanted, it's, it, this, is, this is the book of the year from that, that organization, so I understand it's a, it's a good read and it's an excellent book to get. With that, I introduce the evening. Well, y'all got your sugar fix. I guess that's the drug of choice for Mormons. <laughs> I noticed even the Barks was the red cream soda, which does not have the caffeine, as the uh, root beer does have. So if you're looking for that, you're probably disappointed. <laughs> oh, he found, oh, he found, he found the real stuff. He's got, oh, that one doesn't have it in it. Oh, in Utah, they take it out. Yeah, another reason to be that? <laughs> Following years of secret practice and public denial, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints finally admitted to the practice of polygamy in 1852. Following that public acknowledgement, increasingly vehement criticism of the Utah Mormons became a significant preoccupation of the national press. In an effort to defend the Church against such criticism, while also hoping to provide additional organs for proselyting the Gentile world, Brigham Young established four new periodicals. Apostle Orson Pratt was sent to Washington, D.C. to publish The Seer, a journal specifically designed to advocate and defend polygamy. Apostle and future president of the church, John Taylor, was selected as the publisher editor of The Mormon, based in New York City. Apostle Erastus, Erastus Snow was assigned to the St. Louis Luminary, and George Q. Cannon, destined to serve as first counselor to four church presidents, and the man who arguably would become the most powerful, powerful voice for 19th century Mormonism after Joseph Smith and Brigham Young was assigned at the tender age of 28 to edit and publish a newspaper in San Francisco, California. By the way, I can't, I can't prove it, but I suspect that uh, George Buchanan may have been the first person to coin the phrase the Sodom of the Pacific for uh, San Francisco. We use that phrase a lot. Great, thanks. Of these four periodicals, the Western Standard was clearly the most interesting. Cannon pulled no punches as he played the role of LDS apologist, taking on one journalistic enemy after another. Perhaps it was the courage and even recklessness that comes with youth that made Cannon so bold in his attacks. Perhaps it was because he had not yet been saddled with the sober responsibilities of the apostleship that made him more feisty than Pratt, Snow, or even his uncle, John Taylor. Whatever the reason, George Buchanan successfully started, and more often than not, ended a number of newspaper wars that are still fascinating to read or hear today. This presentation is extracted from my book, Defending Zion, George Buchanan and the California Mormon Newspaper Wars of 1856 to 1857. It was published about six months ago by the Arthur H. Clark Company as volume five in its Kingdom in the West series. Actually, Scott suggested I not do this, but I'm going to anyway. Because I know what's going to happen. Some of you are going to pick this book up, and you're going to see a certain name connected with this book, and it'll have a, basically the same effect as garlic to vampires. Um, that name, of course, is none other than Will Bagley. 
Um, Will is the general editor of this series. And certainly Will and I disagree on a lot of things. Uh, most uh, emphatically some of the conclusions he drew in his recent book on the, uh, on the massacre. But I want to just say this in, on behalf of Will, that throughout this editorial process, he continually reminded me that this was my book, not his, and that the final editorial decisions were mine, the final interpretations were mine. And I want to thank uh, Will for that approach that he took to this book. And, uh, and his, I must acknowledge that it's a much more interesting book than it would have been without his contributions. So don't let uh, his association with this, with this series scare you away. This paper will focus on some especially engaging exchanges between Cannon's Western Standard and two other California newspapers. The first will be The Pacific, a self-proclaimed weekly journal devoted to religion, education, and useful intelligence. The second combatant will be The Daily California American, the precursor to today's very prominent Sacramento Bee. As the presentation proceeds, I'll be reading the righteously indignant editorials written by Cannon, as my wife Helen, without whom this book would have never been possible, gives morally superior voice to the editors of the Pacific and the Daily California American, both of which so often found themselves under unrelenting fire by the young can. Hang them up like pirates, the Mormons, saints, or sinners. Though they call themselves saints, the Mormons never thought of themselves as perfect. Many of Joseph Smith's revelations reminded them of their individual and collective shortcomings. Nonetheless, they considered themselves God's chosen people and firmly believed it would be through their efforts that the Lord's second coming would soon become reality. Their enemies, old as well as new, accused the Latter-day Saints of every foul deed imaginable. There was nothing new about the crimes attributed to the Mormons by the California newspapers. Witness the following list, compiled by the infamous John C. Bennett, formerly mayor of Nauvoo, Major General of the Nauvoo Legion and Assistant President of the Church in his 1842 attack on his erstwhile brethren. Quote, It appears from the mass of evidence in this expose that the Mormon hierarchy are guilty of infidelity, deism, atheism, lying, deception, blasphemy, debauchery, lasciviousness, bestiality, <laughs> madness, fraud, plunder, larceny, Burglary, robbery, perjury, fornication, adultery, rape, incest, arson, treason, and murder. And they have out Herod and Herod and out devil the devil. <laughs> Not supposed to buy that. <laughs> And you probably you'd have to wait till next week at Salt Lake to hear stuff like that. <laughs> that was John C. Bennett. Given his unquestionable character, Bennett's charges are highly suspect. Whether a fallen believer or a conniving opportunist, Bennett had been excommunicated for many of the moral lapses he denounced. And his objections to Joseph Smith's polygamous relations were less the result of moral outrage than of personal jealousy. Still, the depredations allegedly committed by Joseph Smith's Danites and Brigham Young's destroying angels provided plenty of smoke, if not fire, to blacken the name of early Mormonism. By 1856, there was no lack of controversial topics useful in attacking the young religion. As the voice of the LDS Church in California, Cannon had to fend off charges involving the character of Joseph Smith, Utah theocracy under Brigham Young, the Willie Martin handcart disaster, and of course, scandalous tales of young women abducted into sexual slavery by the crafty elders of Salt Lake. When the San Francisco Pacific reprinted a richly imaginative story about the crimes and moral degeneracy reigning in Utah territory, George Q. Cannon immediately responded, launching a lengthy newspaper battle that eventually drew in the Daily California American. The episode affords a glimpse into the psyche of Americans in general, and Californians in particular, as they tried to make sense of the theocratic, communalistic, and polygamic system known as Mormonism. Westerners, especially those living on the borders of Utah territory, perceive this encounter with the other as a clear and present danger, as is obvious from the unrelenting, unrelenting editorial opprobrium California newspapers hurled at the saints. Whether Cannon truly believed he could deflect such criticism by pointing out the logical fallacies of his opponents while often returning their vituperation in an is an open question but he did not shrink from his mission as a church apologist to portray his people as more sinned against than sinning. Mormonism, the Pacific, 
6 November 1856. Among a party of 900 Mormons who recently left comfortable homes